By the end of this video, you'll know everything you need to know about The Crossing by Cormac McCarthy. I'm not going to give anything away, but I am going to dig into one of the descriptions in the novel, which is probably the best description I've ever read. This is the second installment in the Border Trilogy, but you shouldn't think of it as a sequel to All the Pretty Horses, which is the first novel. All the Pretty Horses and The Crossing don't share any characters but they do have a decent amount of similarities. They're both coming of age stories and they both do involve characters coming from America and crossing the border into Mexico. The Crossing has a lot of characteristics that are typically associated with a kind of novel called a picaresque. A typical picaresque novel is told kind of in chronological serial fashion think almost like a soap opera, but like in literary novel form. The main character in this book is a guy named Billy, and he's tracking a wolf. Billy is about 16 years old at the beginning of the novel, and the time period when this takes place is before the Second World War. It's a pretty long novel. It's longer than All the Pretty Horses, and there's so much space in it. The experience of reading it is that of going on this journey with Billy, the main character. There are some Cormac McCarthy fans that like this novel better than all of his others. My personal favorite Cormac McCarthy novel is the third in this trilogy. So there's All the Pretty Horses, The Crossing, and then without giving anything away, there are characters from each of those first two novels that are in the third one. And that's part of what ties the stories together and makes them a trilogy instead of just a series of westerns that are set in roughly the same place. I'd like to read you a paragraph that I still think about casually in the middle of the day unprompted sometimes. I did a master class in college with Lydia Davis who's an incredible writer in her own right and out of anything she could have possibly picked she picked this paragraph for us to take a really close look at as a group. Here it goes it's on page 17 of the novel and all the context you really need is that there are some characters entering a, a new space so this is kind of a description of that new space they're entering. The cabin when they opened it was dark and musty and had about it a waxy smell like fresh killed meat. Their father stood in the door a moment and then entered. In the front room was an old sofa, a bed, a desk. They went through the kitchen and then on through to the mudroom at the back of the house. There in the dusty light from the one small window on shelves of rough sawed pine stood a collection of fruit jars and bottles with ground glass stoppers and old apothecary jars, all bearing antique octagon labels edged in red, upon which, in Eccles' neat script, were listed contents and dates. In the jars, dark liquids. Dried viscera, liver, gall, kidneys, the inward parts of the beast, who dreams of man, and has so dreamt in running dreams a hundred thousand years and more. Dreams of that malignant, Lesser God, come pale and naked and alien to slaughter all his clan and kin and rout them from their house. A God insatiable, whom no seeding could appease, nor any measure of blood. The jars stood webbed in dust, and the light among them, made of the little room with its chemic glass, a strange basilica dedicated to a practice as soon to be extinct among the trades of men as the beast to whom it owed its being. Their father took down one of the jars and turned it in his hand and set it back again precisely in its round track of dust. On a lower shelf stood a wooden ammunition box with dovetailed corners, and in the box a dozen or so small bottles or vials with no labels to them. Written in red crayon across the top board of the box were the words, Number 7 Matrix. Their father held one of the vials to the light and shook it and twisted out, the cork and passed the open bottle under his nose. Good God, he whispered. Let me smell it, Boyd said. No, said his father. He put the vial in his pocket. And so the scene goes on. The amount of sensory input that's packed into that one paragraph and then that wild aside that it goes on in the middle is just what I would point to as like, if you're going to describe a scene, this is the way to do it. Just think about the sense of smell at the end and all of the things you can feel in that paragraph. The 
the crayon, the the dust setting the jar back down perfectly where it had been sitting among the dust. That's just a taste of what you can expect in The Crossing. As always with a Cormac McCarthy novel, there's going to be a good bit of violence. The dialogue will be excellent. You'll think about things in a new way. This novel is definitely influenced by Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. The way that Cormac McCarthy talks about wolves in particular really reminds me of kind of the way whales are discussed in Moby Dick. I know at one point Cormac McCarthy was really trying to figure out a way to get closer to the perspective of the wolf that is featured really prominently towards the beginning of the story. And um, the other novel that definitely Cormac McCarthy studied pretty closely prior to writing this one is Pedro Paramo by Juan Rolfo, which is a really famous Mexican novel. Pedro Paramo is pretty ethereal and ghostly. I don't want to discuss that novel in too great of depth, but there's kind of an ambling quality to it, even though it's a shorter work that mirrors kind of how the story progresses in The Crossing. You definitely don't need to read All the Pretty Horses before you read The Crossing. So if you're deciding between the two, like if The Crossing seems more interesting to you than All the Pretty Horses, you can read it first. There's an incredible payoff to reading All the Pretty Horses and The Crossing and then reading Cities of the Plain, which is the third book in the trilogy. And I definitely would not read Cities of the Plain before you read The Crossing or All the Pretty Horses. Just even knowing like who's in Cities of the Plain will immediately spoil a lot of things that happened in the first two novels in the trilogy. Let me know what you think of this novel if you've already read it. I love discussing it, even in like a comments section. As you know, if you've been following along with the content on this channel, Cormac McCarthy is one of my favorite writers. He lived a good long life and he left us with a lot of great material. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you. If you haven't already subscribed, definitely consider doing so. I'll be making book-related content on this channel indefinitely. If you like Cormac McCarthy, I'm sure I'll be making more videos about him and his novels at some point in the future. He's one of my favorite writers, and so it's only going to be natural that I uh, want to talk about him. I'm reading some other stuff right now, but just reading aloud that one paragraph in this video really makes me want to reread one of Cormac McCarthy's novels. So I think I might start one later today if I can get to it. Take it easy and I'll see you in the next one.